here we go. Okay, so Ronki Sisar and uh, Iris, over to you. There's two pages, by the way. Okay. Right. The people of Israel are told to each contribute exactly half a shekel of silver to the sanctuary. Instructions are also given regarding the making of the sanctuary's water basin, anointing oil and incense. Wise-hearted artisans, Betzalel and Naholiab, are placed in charge of the sanctuary's construction, and the people are once again commanded to keep the Shabbat. When Moses does not return when expected from Mount Sinai, the people make a golden calf and worship it. God proposes to destroy the errant nation, but Moses intercedes on their behalf. Moses descends from the mountain, carrying the tablets of the testimony engraved with the Ten Commandments. Seeing the people dancing about their idol, he breaks the tablets, destroys the golden calf, and has the primary culprits put to death. He then returns to God to say, if you do not forgive them, blot me out from the book that you have written. God forgives, but says that the effect of their sin will be felt for many generations. At first, God proposes to send his angel along with them, but Moses insists that God himself accompany his people to the promised land. Moses prepares a new set of tablets and once more ascends the mountain, where God re-inscribes the covenant on these second tablets. On the mountain, Moses is also granted a vision of the divine 13 attributes of mercy. So radiant is Moses' face upon his return that he must cover it with a veil, which he removes only to speak with God and to teach his laws to the people. Right, it's the famous mask centre that came up at the beginning of COVID. Okay, so thank you very much. How long that so, yes. Sorry? Uh, how long did it last, this radiant? I don't know. I, don't know. Uh, I think at least, uh, I think possibly 40 days. It definitely lasted a, a decent amount of time. This, of course, is where Michelangelo got his horns from. Yeah, I know. Laura says that there were rays of light coming out of his face, and the word for a ray of light is a Karen. And it was, so not just Michelangelo, the, the whole Jews and horns business comes from that, a mistranslation. Um, just like Almana in Isaiah, I think, is it? Mistranslated as an elderly woman, as a virgin. And that's how Christianity started. Anyway, so um, let's go back. Oh, sorry, it says Tatavit, Kisissa. Whoops, wrong center at the top. Ignore that. Should say Kisissa. Right. Now, let's just go back to, so we've got this line. He says, um, Moshe says, if you don't forgive them, block me out from your book. So let's just look at last week's Sedra a minute. Right, yeah, let's look at that more, more clearly. Right, this is an exact quote. Who would like to read source number one? First now, quote. Oh, yeah. Now, if you would forgive their sins, well and good. But if not, erase me from the record which you have written. Right, so it's this conditional statement, okay? Um, Oh, hold on, hold on. Because yeah, sorry, I'm just recording. It's this conditional statement. If you forgive them, fine. If not, erase me from your book. Right? Did he forgive them? Well, yes, we're here today, well, right? <laughs> yes. Did he erase them from his book? No. No. Well, only from one bit. One Cedra. Yes, do you remember what Cedra it was? Last week. Yeah, right. Yethro. Was it Yethro? No, it was last week. Tatava. Moshe's name is missing from last week, etc. Anyone else know what else happened last week? Whose yacht type was it? Well, we had the uh, priest's clothing. Yes. And whose yacht type was last oh, week? Oh, Moses. 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 Right. Moses. Yeah. Yes. So, interestingly, we're going to see in a minute the Balhaturim on the first verse of last week, etc. The Atat at Tzava, where it doesn't say Moshe's name, you shall give instructions. So there are two classic explanations given for the omission of. It's very unusual to have a Sedra without motion. From the beginning of Shemos onwards, I think there's one or two in Devarim where he's not mentioned, actually. But certainly Shemos, by Ikra Bamidbar, he's in every Sedra. He's the main man. So, you know, he's the uh, man of the match, whatever. He's the, uh, he's the central character. So it's very unusual. And last week's Sedra is all about him, but it doesn't mention him by name. So there are two reasons given, I think. One is that it's an allusion to the fact that he would ultimately leave this world. Most years, I think, Tatava is the week of Zion Adar of his yacht site. 
And the second one is because of this statement of his erasing from your book. Let's have a look. Uh, who'd like to read? Ah, where's it gone? Second. Number two, if it will let me. Okay, number two, this is the Balaturim, right? Yeah, uh, who'd like to read that? Go. And you are to issue instructions, etc. Moshe has not been mentioned by name in this portion, seeing that he had said to God that he should erase his name from his book. That's from Exodus 32, 32, yeah. Although, which, is what we just, which is what we just read, yeah. yeah. I, well, I just put up on the screen, yeah. <clears throat> Although Moshe has said this conditionally, for example, if God were to kill the Jewish people as a punishment for the sin of the golden calf, we have a rule that a curse of a sage, even if uttered only as something conditionally, it is taken by God at face value. Right. So even though it was conditional, it was if it's taken at face value. We have other examples where when someone utters basically a curse, it pretty much comes true. Right. We have Yaakov and Rocco who who stole the idols. We have Yiftach who says that he'll sacrifice the first thing he sees and his daughter appears and there's different views as to what happened subsequently. So I actually had a slightly different reading of this, which I don't remember where I got it from. My reading of this was, maybe this is just imagined because I couldn't, I was trying to find a source for this. The classic explanation is that basically Moshe said, erase me from your book. It was basically a curse, like taking out the book, even though Hashem saved the people. He said, but your curse will come true anyway. Um, the way I read it was that Hashem was basically saying to Moshe, I'm not going to destroy the people. And you've done well, as they say, you just good gazog. You spoke well, you spoke well, and you've saved the people. However, out of deference to your humility, that you were prepared to have your name taken out of the Torah, that you basically, through your actions and words, said that the Torah is not as important to you as the Jewish people, that even the Torah is subservient to the Jewish people, your humility, your willingness to have your name removed out of deference to you will have a cedra where I take your name out. That was how I read it. But anyway, that's... Uh, yeah. um, so we have to tell her where his name isn't mentioned. Um, although his name is all over the cedra. It says constantly, you will this and you will that. Um, let's just see what Rabbi Huda says in the Gemara. Who'd like to read number three? Okay. Yeah. I, I will. <coughs> uh, Ra Rav Yehuda says that Rav says, with regard to the curse of a sage, even if it is baseless, that is, based on a mistaken premise, it nevertheless comes to fruition and affects the object of the curse. Right. So here, it was conditional. It was if you won't forgive them. In other cases, like with Yaakov Rochel, it was unintentional. I mean, he didn't know who stole the idols, but nonetheless, Basically, careful what you wish for, right? Words are very powerful. That's what we learn from this. So that's the story. So anyway, that's by way of introduction, that we see a taste, we already know, but we get a taste of who Moshe Rabbeinu is. Moshe Rabbeinu is not, with the greatest respect, Boris Johnson, who probably at some point is going to hang on to power at all costs, or, you know, Arab dictators that put their people through hell because they would never dream of, you know, uh, um, dream of, of, of leaving. You know, it's interesting, this business with Cressida Dick. I, I don't understand politics, but she said she was forced to resign because the mayor lost confidence in her. Now, as I understand it, he summoned her to a meeting. And that was basically, I guess, I guess that's like in some jobs, if your boss calls you in for a meeting, you know it's curtains for you. But he didn't actually say he was getting rid of her. So, but obviously that was understood that way. So I suppose... You know, he couldn't get rid of her because she was appointed by the government. Right, he's got no power to get rid of her. So it's more, uh, uh, but, 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 but she, she, maybe she was just saving face to her credit. At least she, I don't know if she was a particularly bad person, uh, well, bad person, bad at her job. I mean, there were, there were way too many, way too much loss of public confidence in the police. It has been suggested if she wasn't a woman, she would have gone sooner because people are worried. They'll say, oh, the first female comm commissioner, she couldn't cut it. I don't know. But to her credit, she stepped down. She didn't wait till the bitter end, right? Moshe Rabbeinu is way above that. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I don't care if you take my name out of the book. No one will ever... No, if, if Moshe wasn't in the Torah, no one would ever hear of him, right? He said, I don't care. I don't care. I just care about the people. God says, wow, what a great leader you are. 
so that's setting the scene for this question about the breaking of the tablet. So let's have a look. Um, okay. Um, how do we know, by the way, that Moshe died on the seventh of other? The Gemara discusses that basically, if you work backwards from, um, if you look in the book of Joshua, which we've been learning, it says that they uh, at the end of Moshe's mourning period, they had a few days to get ready, and then they had Battle of Jericho, and then they celebrated Pesach, and it's all within a short time frame. So if you look at the timing, it basically works out that it makes sense. They would have died on the seventh of Adar, and they would have had a month of mourning till a week before Pesach. So that's tradition, it's the seventh of Adar. Whether it was Adar Rishon or Adar Shani is a different discussion, which I touched on in my shul learning last week. It's probably not for now, because we could discuss it for a long time. Um, but anyway, I was trying to get a straight answer out to people. Our Hebra Kaddish should do it in the winter, the, the traditional Suda. But I was trying to get a straight answer out of people whether other Hebras do it in the first other or second other, but they're all very secretive, so they wouldn't tell me. Um, hi. Oh, thank you. Got waiters these days. Amazing. Right. Okay. Next. Um, okay. Now let's look at the tablets. Right. So, what's the story with the tablets? Um, Moshe breaks the tablets. We've come across this before. Let's have a look. Uh, we're going to skip that. I'm going to write. Who would like to read uh, number five, which is the later recollection in the book of Zavorim, and then we'll have a look at the actual account in the book of Shemos. So who would like to go read this? Who hasn't okay. read yet? Julian, go for it. I yep. saw how you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a molten calf. You had been quick to stray from the path that the Lord had enjoined upon you. Thereupon I ripped the two tablets and flung them away with both my hands, smashing them before your eyes. <coughs> okay. And that's how it's referred to in Devorim. Uh, does he use the word angry? No, he doesn't actually, does he? No. What does he say in the uh, in this week's Edra? Do you want to just carry on, Julian, from it? As soon as Moshe came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, he became enraged. And he hurled the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. Right, so I don't know what, what Heide you all went to, but I'm pretty sure I learned the Heide. Basically, Moshe had an anger problem, right? Between smashing tab tablets and, and s s hitting rocks, he had an anger problem, essentially. He got angry. It's understandable why he got angry, but he lost it. And when he lost it, he broke the tablets. He broke the tablets! I mean, they were like, what, what are you doing? This is the word of God, and you're breaking it. So... Ah, that's anyone else learn that Hader? Basically, that's how you learn the story, right? He was angry. He was angry for good reasons because he was angry. He broke the tablets. There are so many questions. So, yeah. Sorry. I guess so. Yeah. There are so many questions, right? Is it not an affront to Hashem to break these holy tablets? You know, we go to great lengths to bury things, and here's Moshe just smashing them. Um, doesn't it undermine the authority of the very commandments that say not to worship idols? Was it a spontaneous reaction? Was it a public display of anger? Was it a temper tantrum? Did he just lose the plot? And um, why not give them back to Hashem? Say, so, you know what? You know, these people are not ready for this. Uh, I, I'll return them to you. And yet he's not told off by God. We'll see in a moment that not only is he not told off, but he gets approval. So there are actually six reasons given there's probably more, but there are six I found that are given in the sources for the breaking of the tablets. And we'll go through them. The first one, I'm not going to read, <coughs> it's really slightly cumbersome, but basically the Gemara in, I don't know where, it doesn't tell us where, says that actually Hashem did tell him to do it. And it, it, it goes through a few examples. It says, Rabbi Huda ben Basera said that Moshe only broke the tablets when told to by the Almighty, as it says, mouth to mouth I said to him, and he, Rabbi Huda says, what did he say to him? He basically whispered in his ear, break the tablets. Rabbi Lazar ben Azariah says that Moshe performed miracles for all of Israel, meaning that he was commanded by God to do it. Rabbi Akiva says that uh, when Moshe says, I took a hold of the tablets and broke them, that you can only take hold of something if God lets you. So basically, it's all Hashgach HaPratis, which is an argument for anything, really. And Rabbi Meir says he only broke the tablets when he was told to straight from the Almighty. As the Almighty said... Although he said it afterwards, and this is a crucial phrase here, Asher Shibata. Now, in this week's Sedra, when God tells Moshe to make a second set of tablets, he says, make a second set of tablets like the first set, Asher, which Shibata you broke. Right? So, Moshe, you broke the first set, make a second set. 
So the commentaries say, and we'll come to it in a few moments on the screen, Asher Shibarta is a pun, uh, not a pun, a, a sort of, I would say, double entendre, it has a connotation, it's, it's a double meaning. Asher Shibarta, which you broke, Asher Yashar Yishar Koichacha. Asher, which Yishar is a play on words of Yishar. Yishar means, may you be strong from your actions. I endorse your actions. Yishar Koichacha sounds like Yasha Koyach. Sounds like Yishkoyach. People say to people, right, when they do something. This is where it comes from. Yishar Koyach. That may you only be strengthened through your actions. It's basically, it's only said afterwards. But the Gemara says that Moshe knew basically that Hashem was endorsing it. Right? There are very few things that Moshe did of his own accord. Right? One of the others that comes to mind is sending the spies or striking the rock. So he may have done this of his own accord, but it was aligned with Hashem's will. Look, this is Moshe Rabbeinu, who God talks to all the time. You know, it's a bit like um, there was a rabbi who died recently called Rabbi, let me get this right. I think it was Oh Crumbs. I think it was Moshe Tendler was his name. He, or maybe it was Mordechai Tendler. I don't remember. Rabbi Tendler, he was one of the Rosh Shivas at YU. He was son-in-law of Rabbi Moshe Feinstein, the very famous, like, great posek and, you know, the halakhic authority of pretty much the previous generation, the 50s, 60s, 70s. And um, Rabbi Tendler was Rabbi Moshe's son-in-law. He wasn't just his son-in-law. He was his kind of prize student. He, as they, they say, you know, he sort of sat at his feet and sort of absorbed his teachings. So after Rav Moshe, and even in his lifetime, but certainly after he passed away, when people wanted to know what did Rav Moshe say about things, they would go to his son-in-law. Because his son-in-law would basically was his mouthpiece. And he had spent so long absorbing his teachings that he was basically, I don't say a carbon copy, but you know, he was his protege. So um, when you have I mean, Moshe Rabbeinu, who is God's protege, he doesn't just go off script. Right. Interestingly, the times he does go off script is when he's angry, but he doesn't just go off script. So as for the strike of the rock, I can't comment on that, why that happened at this point. But the break of the tablets to say that Moshe Rabbeinu would decide of his own accord to break this precious thing without any input from God, beggars belief. So Rabbi says in reality, it was in line with Hashem's will. So that's reason number one is basically Hashem told him to, maybe not in so many words. OK, reason number two, who would like to read? Who hasn't read yet? Uh, Deborah Barrel, do you want to read? Oh, Beryl, sorry, you can't see the screen. Deborah, you want to read? Yes, I'll read. Um, yeah. Reasons for smashing tablets, too. It was stated in the name of Ra Rabbi Nehem Nehemiah. The writing itself flew off Babli Basahim. So I think, I think I've jumbled that up somewhere. Um, just go from the end of the third line where it says the tablets were a load of 40 sar. Sorry. Right. The tablets were a load of 40 sar. Yeah. Uh, the writing was carrying them. When the writing flew off, they were too heavy for Moisha's hands. They fell and broke. That didn't quite come out right. But I think the quote was, it says that, that when, when Moshe saw the golden calf, the tablets themselves, the writing flew off. The words flew off. And the tablets were 40 sar. Now, 40 sar, I'm slightly confused here, because a sar can be a measure of grain or a measure of liquid. So a mikvah has 40 sar of water. That's quite mm. a lot of water. If you've ever tried lifting a bucket of water, it's very heavy. You can't lift a mikvah full of water. Mm. So the tablets were stone. They weighed, you know, you can't, if you imagine a matzeva, you can't lift one by yourself. So these were heavy tablets. So the Gemara says that while the writing was on them, it basically, you know, it was so holy that it kind of they floated as soon as the writing fell off the tablets fell from Moshe's hands and broke I suppose I thought to myself that you could read this differently you could read this as a bit like you know if you're carrying something that's not a burden to you you'll carry, you know if you're holding a very heavy trophy then it will feel like light because you're so happy to receive it but if you're holding something that's very you know sad and upsetting then you're more inclined to drop it you can't hold it it's too heavy to bear so i wondered if it was metaphorical that the tablets became too heavy to bear the burden that he dropped them i don't know anyway the Morris says reason number two they were too heavy i did a lunch and learn for kinloss last week online i did this basically this um 
share pretty much. Uh, and somebody said they learned that in Cheder. So I said they went to better Cheder than me. So that's reason number two is the tablets became too heavy, whether it's because the writing came off, whether it's a metaphor for the burden that Moshe was carrying, right? Um, you know, like if, you get, if you're holding something precious and you get a sudden fright and you drop it, you know, something like that, right? Okay. Number three. <coughs> Who would like to read number three? So I'll read number three. It's a bit, it's a bit convoluted. He broke the tablets following the sin of the golden calf. What source led him to do so? Moshe said, when it comes to the Pesach offering, which is only one of the 630 mitzvahs, the Torah tells us that God said to Moshe and Aaron, this is the law of the Pesach offering, no foreigner, no alien shall eat of it. This doesn't only mean a Gentile, but a Jew who has become foreign. So an apostate Jew, a denier. At that moment, all of Israel were like apostates. I, I don't know what you call apostates nowadays, heretics, whatever, because they were worshipping the calf. So they weren't worthy of receiving the Torah. So in other words, Moshe says to himself, Oy va voy. even something as simple as eating lamb. For Pesach, which is how they celebrate it in those days, the Torah says that if you, if you don't believe in God, you can't eat it. And here you have these people who don't believe in God, they're worshipping idols. Well, I'm going to give them the whole, excuse me, the whole Torah, forget about it. That's reason number three, that basically they would, by law, not be allowed to have it because if they're not allowed to do the Korban Pesach, they're not allowed to do the other mitzvah. Okay, then we have three other reasons, which are slightly more, uh, let's see. Okay, who wants, uh, I'll do number four as well because it's slightly hard to written, slightly cumbersome, and then I'll hand, cumbersomely, I will hand back to everyone else. So number four is a, is a famous midrash, which basically is, it says, why did Moshe break the tablet? So the Midrash says, imagine a king, he travels abroad, his wife stays at home with the maidservants, and she's alone with these, you know, young girls and handsome footmen, and rumors begin to circulate, right? If you don't think rumors could ever circulate, think about the royal family today, right? All the rumors, whether true or not true, right? So because she's been left alone with all these servants, rumors start to circulate that she's cavorting with them and she's parting with them and she's staying up late with them and she's leaving people's bedrooms in the middle of the night. And, you know, it could all be vicious rumors, but the king hears them, comes home and typical king, right? he might love her, but he's still a king, wants to kill her. The king's advisor, in the meantime, tears up the marriage certificate. So he says to himself, you know, when the king comes along and says, oh, she's my wife, you know, she's, betraying me i'll say she's not your wife anymore you know we we tore up the contract it was the maidservants that were misbehaving and they started all the rumors and the king then will basically renew his marriage with her so it says the same idea of moshe he says you know children of israel are like the bride you know they're basically breaking the marital contract whether it's in the in this in this midrashic tale it may or may not have been true in our case it was true but they're basically basing the contract i'll tear up the contract and then i can say that they were never married to you in the first place Right, so it's a little kind of legal fiction. That's reason number four. Moshe says, you know, better they should, they're going to be in default of this contract. So I'll tear up the contract, pretend it never existed. Okay, reason number five, uh, who would like to read? Shall I do it, Rabbi? Yeah. When Moshe saw that the Israelites were doomed, he sought a pretext through which to save them. He said, it is written on the tablets that he who sacrifices to gods will be excommunicated. And so I will break them and say to the Holy One, blessed be he, until now they didn't know the punishment for idolatry. If they had, they would not have done it. Tanhuma and Kitissa. His kuni adds, Moshe smashed the tablets in front of the people and said, I did this so as not to make you guilty of transgressing the laws written on these tablets. It was written on them that you are not to have other deities and you had made a golden calf for yourselves. Right. So basically he said, you know, they're going to read these tablets. If they would have known in advance, maybe they wouldn't have done this. They didn't know. So therefore, you know, um, it's kind of the same idea. Better they should not know. Better they should be ignorant. That you can't be, it's kind of a bit like number four, basically. Right? That you can't, you're in default automatically. So better to just tear up the contract. And the final reason, who would like to read number six? <laughs> The Midrash says that Moshe broke the tablets because he thought God would destroy the Jews for their sin and create a new chosen nation from, uh, from Moshe and his descendants. Indeed, back in Exodus, God tells Moshe now, let me be. 
that my anger may blaze forth against them and that I may destroy them and make of you a great nation. The Midrash concludes, upon breaking the tablets, Moshe told God, now I am a sinner just like them. If you decide to eradicate them, destroyed me as well. Right, so let's just to summarize these six reasons, and there may be more given for the smash of the tablets. None is just that he just lost it, right? So reason number one, that God actually indirectly or directly told him to. Number two, that they were too heavy, however we understand that. Number three, that he saw that the Pesach offering can't be brought by a, a heretic. And he thought to himself, if that's true of one mitzvah, imagine the whole Torah. So basically, they can't, they just can't have the Torah. Number four is a variant on that. He said it's like, a, you know, the king goes abroad and the queen basically... Uh, I, uh, you know, she has a wandering eye and better to pretend they were never married in the first place and tear up the marital contract than have her in default. Um, reason number four was a similar, sorry, reason number five, similar reason that he saw that, uh, you know, these tablets say basically that you're not allowed to worship idols. So he thought, if I give this to the people, they'll be in default. So better that it shouldn't be in default. And the sixth reason given is that in the case Hashem says, most you're all right. I'll keep you alive. He said, I'm going to sin as well. I'll break, I'll break the tablets, which Moshe was saying basically is a bad thing to do. And you see, I'm a sinner as well. I broke the tablets. So the last few reasons are very, very, very um, selfless. Right? They all sort of come back to Moshe putting the people first. Okay, so now, what is Moshe's... So that's part of reasons for breaking the tablets, right? So from all this, the, all the Midrashim and the Gemara and the Talmud likes to talk about this clearly they don't think it was just a, a moment of rage it was calculated what is Moshe's greatest achievement let's have a look this is right at the end we read this on Simcha's Torah and then we do Chazak Chazak who'd like to read this anyone says I'll read if you like go never, for it never again did there arise in Israel a prophet like Moshe whom the Lord singled out face to face for various signs and portions that the Lord sent him to display in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his courtiers and his whole country, and for all the great might and awesome power that Moshe displayed before all Israel. Right, and this is like the end of the Torah. That's the story we do that. Now, what, you may know this from previous Shiram, but uh, what does that seem to be talking about? Signs and wonders the Lord sent him in the land of Egypt, the great might and awesome power he displayed before all of Israel. The exact translation is in the eyes of all of Israel. What do you think that's probably talking about? What was his great might and power? What's the most powerful event you can think of? The, the, the plagues. The plagues, right? Maybe the spitting of the sea, the giving of the Torah. At the giving of the Torah was an awesome, awe-inspiring event. Yes? Yep. Right. Okay. Is there any... Is that unclear to you in any way? I mean, it doesn't say it explicitly, but it says the signs and wonders. Signs and wonders always refers to the plagues and the splitting of the sea, right? And the great and awesome, awesome, mighty power, those words are used around the time of the giving of the Torah. So... Without any commentary, is that fairly clear to you? That's a summary of Moshe's life. He did all these amazing things, signs and wonders. He showed great power and might before all of the Jewish people, the power of God and the might of God and Torah, yes? Do, 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 you, need, do you need any interpretation there, do you feel? No. Oh, right. So Rashi, Rashi is not a great philosopher. Rashi is there. He always says, for the Ben Chamesh Lemekra, means the five-year-old. And we often joke that Rashi's explanations are often beyond most of us never mind five-year-olds but the principle on shabbos morning we talked last week i hope i explained it clearly about paradise you have the four levels of understanding pshat which is simple meaning remes which is something which is a deep illusion derush which is like midrash as stories and you know all kinds of allegorical stuff and then so which is the mystical kabbalistic stuff so rashi is supposed to be only pshat so, for example, when it says God spoke to Moshe face to face, I'm sure there's all kinds of mystical explanations of that. But Rashi will only comment if it's lacking clarity on a basic level. So if a word needs explaining to you. So Rashi often gives you words in old French, which doesn't help very much. So like when you have Shemini, it talks about different animals you can eat. Rashi explains what the animals are. Right? He doesn't give you the deeper meaning of why the, the chewing the card means you should chew things over before you speak. 
because that's not Rashi's role. That's not Pshat. Pshat means simple meaning. To me, this text is very clear. You don't need any explanation. Rashi doesn't agree. Rashi has a comment on it. And this is Rashi's comment. Leine Kol Yisroel. Who would like to read? Lost track of where we're up to. I will. Go, go on. Oh. Um, which... So this is the last three words in the Torah. Right, the signs and wonders yeah, and which, awesome might, which he did, Lene Kol Yisrael, before all of Israel, yeah. Which Moshe showed before the eyes of all Israel. This refers to the fact that his heart inspired him to shatter the tablets before their eyes, as it is <coughs> said in Deuteronomy, and I broke them before your eyes. Right, so Rashi says, because in Zavorim he later says, Vashabrem Chem. I broke the tablets in front of your eyes. And here it says the miracle, the wonders, the sorry, the strong, uh, <coughs> the mighty power you did before their eyes. Rashi says, break of the tablets. Why is Rashi going off ta- on a tangent? That's not what the text suggests. So according to Rashi, the last few words of the Torah, which surely, you know, you imagine Moshe's retirement party. You know, we're saying goodbye to our great leader, who took us out of Egypt, he gave us the Torah, he did this and did that, he cared for every one of us, he argued with Hashem that we shouldn't be forgiven. And in a moment of weakness, he smashed the tablets, and we had to wait another 40 days to get another set. I mean, it would be akin to, you've been working in a company for, I don't know, 50 years, right? and once in 50 years, when your favourite football team lost, you came into work and you slammed your coffee cup down on the table and it smashed into pieces, spreading coffee everywhere. And the rest of the time you've been a model employee. And at your retirement party, they say, you know, Mordechai, he was great. You know, he was always the first one in the morning. He would mentor his younger colleagues. He was always willing to put in extra hours. He always put the company first. But you know, he'll always be remembered for that time that he couldn't control his anger and he smashed a coffee cup. So you might say that for a joke, but it's not very nice. <laughs> This is Moshe's greatest achievement, his anger, his break of the tablets. So as you understand, Rashi, clearly the break of the tablets must be his greatest achievement. How is it his greatest achievement? Because of what we said in the last three of the six explanations, because the breaking of the tablets is Moshe, the Torah. I mean, this is in philosophical terms, this is mind blowing. The Torah in its last words tells us through Moshe's actions, that the existence of the Torah itself is secondary to the existence of the people of Israel. Right? That's what Moshe is saying to God. He's saying, I don't want to, if the Torah has, if there's no Israel, there's no Torah. Take my name out of your book. Right? Smash the tablets. I don't care. He didn't know there's going to be a second set. For all Moshe knew, he's going to break the tablets and that's going to be the end of history. And he's going to go down to history as the guy that his whole life's work was thrown down the toilet because he couldn't control himself. And he doesn't seem to, that doesn't seem to enter the equation at all. He breaks the tablets according to different reasons because of his love of the Jewish people. This is his greatest act of leadership. But he puts the people first. So when the Torah wants to summarize Moshe's life, yes, he got, took us out of Egypt, did the 10 plagues, got us the Torah on Mount Sinai, as they say, whoopee, okay. But the amazing thing is that with all of that, we see in last week's Sedra when he says, well, in this week's Sedra, which is reflected in what happens in last week's Sedra, when he says, erase me from your book, and when he breaks the tablets, that he's really showing his true colors. His true colors are not that he's a guy with an anger management problem, God forbid. His true colors are that he's somebody that puts his people before everything. And that's what makes him so qualified to be our greatest leader. I've said this so many times before in different forms. So, yes. Lene Kol Yisrael, what did he do before the eyes of all Israel? Broke the tablets, not because he was an angry, you know, uh, uh, spoiled brat who was just having a tantrum, but because it was the greatest thing he could possibly have done. And the proof is that God agreed with him. As we said earlier, and I'll just give you the text now. Here we go. Who'd like to read this from the Talmud from Shabbat? Shall I go? <laughs> yep. And from where do we derive that the Holy One, blessed is he, agreed with Moshe's reasoning, because in the Torah, God refers to the tablets as follows. The first tablets which you broke are Sher Shibata, and Reish Lakish said the phrase refers to Yisha Kohacha 
Sheshibata. May your strength be enriched by your breaking of the tablets. Hence the phrase Yeshe Kochacha. Which has become Yasha Kaya, which has become Shkaya. Okay. Who said so, that, Rabbi? Rashi. Um, uh, Rashi says oh, yeah. it. I think mm. Rashi brings it as well. Look, it's a play on words. Asha Shibata, which you broke. It's interesting because the first time you read it, you might think when God says the, the tablets that you broke, he's pointing the finger. So Rashi says he's actually saying, nice one, mate. Well done. Good move. Good call. He doesn't get punished for it. He gets punished for striking the rock. Doesn't get punished for breaking the tablets. So now, then of course, it's not really all bad because actually the midrash says that two interesting midrashim. One is that Hashem says, "Don't feel bad," because actually the second tablets will have a greater wealth of Torah in them. He says the first set only had the Ten Commandments, but the second set will have the oral law as well. Um, Forty days worth of learning. So he says, actually, we've done okay. Um, the very interesting idea also, which you find occasionally, the first tablets were given with all kinds of, you know, pomp and circumstance, um, what do you call it? Pomp and circumstance. The second set were given quietly. Most of just turns up one day with them, right? 40 days later. So, and uh, it's the second set that endured. So there is a saying that the second set were given, but tina. But tina is like sneot, it means modestly, like in private. So there is an idea that, and this is probably where a lot of the iron horror type stuff comes from as well. There's an idea that when things are done discreetly, they're more successful. So when you make a big splash about something, you attract unwanted attention. That true to truly achieve things, it's done but tina. We have a principle that says hatsnei alechet, that you should go, um, you should go, um, one second, I've just got to urgently just give someone a password, sorry, two seconds, um, that you should you should walk modestly. That's what it means, discreetly and privately. Um, so um, that's one idea. Another idea, which I'm going to skip over just because of time, is that actually says, God says to him, cut for yourself a second set of tablets, right? And the second set of tablets were made from precious stone. I think it says sapphire, does that sound right? Does that ring any bells, sapphire that they were made of? I think no. So, no, maybe not. Maybe I've got that wrong. But apparently they were made out of some kind of expensive marble or precious stone. So um, the commentaries say that when Moshe made the second set, he got to keep the leftover bits as well. So I guess he could sell them on eBay. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's just by the by. However, the second um, set I'm giving you, comma, will also... Yeah. Rabbi, what, what does it mean that, that, that the second set included everything else? How, how could oh, I'm it? not actually sure, unless it refers to the fact that after the giving of the Ten Commandments, he had his 40 days of learning, possibly. I'm not sure. I didn't fully understand that, to be honest. Pass. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me try to come back to you on that one. Um, now, you might say this is all well and good, but don't we say that anger is a very bad character trait? So even if it was contrived, even if it was, you know, uh, a ploy, uh, uh, you know, dramatic effect, isn't anger a bad character trait? And Maimonides discusses that. It's a very good question. Oh, sorry, one second. Um, where is it? Yeah, here we go. One second. Sorry, I missed a couple. Just give me a moment. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip that one. Um, yes, the Avot de Rebinatan mentions it's one of the things that Moshe decided on his own, but was in accordance with the will of the Almighty. Because this is Moshe Rebbeinu. Most things he does are going to be dictated by God, even if they're not dictated explicitly. Right. Um, Let's see what Rambam says about anger. Who would like to be Maimonides today? Who's feeling philosophical? <clears throat> Iris, Johnson? Okay. I think we're back anger to you again. Anger is an extremely evil tendency. One should distance oneself from it by going to the other extreme. One should train oneself <coughs> not to get angry, even when something appears to justify it. The ancient sages said, one who yields to anger is as if he had worshipped idols. Whoever yields to anger, wisdom leaves him if he is a prophet. If one desires to instill reverence in his children and his household, or in public if he is the head of a community, and he wishes to show them his anger so as to bring them back to the good way, he should only act angry in their presence so as to reprove them. But within himself he must remain calm. He should act the part of an angry man, 
when in reality he is not angry. Right. Deal. Okay, so anger has to be a show of anger to get a point across. Uh, or to put it into not politically correct terms of today, nowadays people are frowned upon corporal punishment full stop, but even if you go back 50, 70 years, a person who struck a child in anger and harmed a child, as opposed to somebody who they always used to say that by the Yiddish mama, if she had to give her child a patch, she was crying and she did it, right? So a person who truly believes that they are acting only in the best interests of the person they're trying to show, put on a show, will be pained by it, right? So that's a person who acts angry in order to, right, you know, who, who, who raise their voice and then quickly lower it again once they've made their point, right? But unfortunately, most people don't do that. They get angry. So, you do, so you yes, do is, that, Rabbi, you do that sort of thing with your children and also in teaching. You, right. you, you it, if you really are angry, it's terrible. But if you right, right. Uh, uh, temporarily sh pretend you're angry just right. to get the point over, then right. and then you calm down because you're not right. really angry inside. Right. Um, right. That's so that's what the Ram I'm saying here. You'll see it with a the parent. They can yell at the child one moment and then they'll have a quiet conversation with another child, right? So. This is what Ramam is saying here. So this presumably is what we're saying about Moshe Rabbeinu, that his regular tablets was a measured dramatic effect. Now, there, are, there was a time he lost the plot. When in Bamidbar, right? Why did he not enter the promised land? Because he struck the rock. Why did he strike the rock? We're told he, he was angry. There, it seems, he was actually angry. It wasn't a show. What does he say? He says, listen, you rebels, should we get water for you out of this rock? Right? And his upping the ante so they, they say the commentary said there he was getting angry like listen you rebels you you rebellious lot yeah getting angry and there because he was upset over Korah but these weren't Korah's rebels they were just people that needed a drink and he got angry and there God doesn't forgive him so there are times when anger is not justified and there's a Rambam that's also the Rambam so the suggestion is that here with the break of the tablet it's a measured it's it's a dramatic effect it is a measured like you said, it's like a teacher shouting at their class. It's it's measured. Then my kids come home from school and say the teacher was shouting the whole time. And so, sometimes, not always. Um, and he tried to get to the bottom of it. Was the teacher just trying to, you know, basically discipline the class or was the teacher actually losing it? And, you know, when the teacher is actually losing it, unfortunately, the kids respond in kind and it doesn't work. 100%. Um, so. Rabbi, Rabbi, yeah. all, all, um, I've learned a few a number of years ago that at that time when Moshe hit the rock he was uh, mourning his I'm not excusing it but he was mourning his sister Miriam mm -hmm. at that time that's interesting I've not seen that before so he may have been affected by that that's interesting didn't know that okay so um look it's all part of God's plan for him not to enter the promised land but obviously what we see is that's the reason um good old King Solomon in Kohelas, chapter three, verse five, says, Eis avonim, eis kenos avonim. There's a time for throwing stones and a time for gathering stones, right? So there's a time when you have to, I guess, I don't know exactly what throwing stones is. It could be stoning people, unfortunately. That's what they used to do. I don't think it's referring to throwing stones at people driving on Shabbos, but anyway. And then he says, there's a time for gathering stones. So uh, the Dasa Kanim, who is a, I don't remember who that is, that he commentary says, this is talking about the tablets. There was a time when the right thing to do was to throw them on the ground, and there was a time when the right thing to do was to gather the new ones. Um, okay. Does it, does, it also, does it also mean there's a time for everything? Yes, I mean, that's the whole thing, a time for war, yeah. time for peace, right? Yeah. Everything has its right time. Look, look, uh, yeah, that is, uh, that is not how it starts off. Look, how's the man the ace? Yeah. Everything has its like, everything has its time and place before the sun. Yes. So I think the introduction to that section, if I'm not mistaken, I should probably look it up actually instead of just pontificating. I don't have a chumash. Yeah. There's a time for everything under the sun. The time yes. for and then it says harvest, yeah. time for sowing. Thank time, you. Yeah. There we time go. for war, time for peace. Yeah. It's the time for gathering stones for future throwing. <laughs> or is that just Belfast? Hope not. <laughs> um, so, um, <coughs> so, so, so that's we've come across this before, but it's just a slightly different angle. That's 
Moshe's um, coup de grace, the break of the tablets. Uh, and by the way, it's not contrived, right? It's not Moshe Rabbeinu who's sitting there saying, how can I uh, make myself look really good in the future in the history books? I know what I'll do. I'll posture that, you know, God can take my name out of the book. He'll never actually do it. He can't afford to. You know, it, this is genuine. This is, again, it is humility. How many people do you know that, you know, you know, say about the, you know, the Jewish mothers, or any mother, throw themselves in front of a bus for their kids, you know? How, how many people would do that for their followers, for their flock, you know? How many people would risk their own reputation for their flock? fall on their sword for their flock and that's what Moshe is doing pretty amazing so yes the hypothesis is that this was his greatest achievement not because he broke the tablets but what it represented symbolically in terms of his relationship with his people his relationship with God and if you say oh stuff and nonsense he was just angry why did the commentary say that God agreed with him why would he um one more point what happened to the broken tablets Perhaps they, they were, were gathered the up, like Solomon said. Sorry? Perhaps they were gathered up, like Solomon said. Let's have a look. But they, they, they were put up in the Muscan. They, they, they were they in the ark. Pieces. Right, let's yeah. have a look. Who wants to read number 17? I'll do it again. From where oh. did Rabbi Mayer derived that the broken pieces of the first set of tablets were placed in the ark? from the fact that God told Moses, Moshe, hew for yourself two tablets of stone, like the first. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, <coughs> put them in the ark. This teaches that both the second set of tablets and the broken pieces of the first set of tablets were placed in the ark. Right, so just to clarify, it says in Devorim, Carve for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the word that's on the first tablets which you broke, and you shall put them in the ark. Now, if this was English, what are you putting in the ark? What's the last item referenced? Um, I would say that grammatically it should be the the new ones would be put in the ark because you you're breaking the uh, um, the the which you broke is a um an addition to it <coughs> talking about the first tablets but Correct. the sentence is going you could remove which you broke at, yes um, yes so it's a kind of a sub clause it's, it's a plot, i will write on the tablets yeah. comma sorry clause. clause i will write on the tablets comma the word true if you want to be mischievous you can also read it i will write on the tablets the words that are on the first tablets which you broke and you shall put them yeah. in the ark so anyway the gemara says that this Before is kind of ambiguous and you should actually put both sets in the ark. And the broken pieces were placed in the ark with the second set. Rabbi, Moshe wrote the second set. Moshe wrote the second tablets. It says here that um, um, Hashem did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the tablets were broken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moshe wrote the tablets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moshe wrote the tablets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Moshe had to um, uh, carve the, the rock and then God would write on it. Yeah, I think so, yeah. So, no, it's wrong. It, 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 was, it was the finger of God wrote the first set. Yes, good question. So what's this? Yes, like I will write one. on the tablets. Yes, I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets. He said he dictated. Could be a mistranslation. I'll look it up. I'll look it up in a minute. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll, let me just look it up now. One second. Zoran 10 wants to. Good question. Let's just look it up. Just stop sharing for a minute. Let's just look it up quickly. Good question, actually. Sometimes things don't make sense. Right, 10 wants to two. Let's see. Anyway, in the meantime, what do we learn from that? So Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson, great, very good, uh, very good speaker and author, says, well, we learn a very profound lesson from this, which is that you have to own your baggage and your mistakes. The, the first tablets represent a, a huge mistake of the Jewish people. Um, hmm, he does say, God says, I will inscribe. That's interesting. Let's see Rashi. One second. Oh, sorry, one second. Let me just see Rashi in a moment. Computer's going very slowly, as usual. Wow, there's no Rashi on it at all. <laughs> okay. Why does he say, I will inscribe? Oh. 
Well, I hope we haven't been learning it wrong all this time. Mm, good question. Not sure. Okay, we need to. Mm, okay, uh, just give me a moment. Let's see if we. Can... But what does it actually say in the Torah that in the it, in that says, um in it that says, part? It, it that says part. Right, so he's quoting God as saying, "I will write on the tablets." Um, sorry, let me just go out of Zoom on my computer because it's just slowing me down. One second. Okay. Um, he says, it says, oh, whoops, it's not recording. It says, I will write, um, which seems to be Hashem speaking. I'm just looking up the sort of the commentaries quickly. Um, anyway, just in case anyone has to go, just before we look this up. So Rabbi Jacobson says, basically, we learn from this, that uh, the correct approach is not to throw your baggage away, but to take it with you, you know, to own your mistakes. In the same way that the, there was a constant reminder of the golden calf in the form of the broken tablets, that not that you should be, it should be ashamed, but it should basically shape your destiny, that you should... Uh, you should own your mistakes, you should live with them, you should carry your baggage with you rather than trying to suppress it. But that's what makes you a stronger person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right, I'm just looking at the commentary on that. One second, let's see. Uh, oh, there's no Rashi on that, that's strange. Right, okay, who have we got? Um, oh, that's okay then. Yeah. I will write, let's see, I will write. No one seems too concerned about it. Strange. Have we been learning it wrong all this time then? Well, no, I wouldn't go that far. Just one second, one second. No, I'm just looking, trying to get to the bottom of this. Hmm. Uh, looking at Sfari, which has good commentary stuff, not seeing anything at the moment. Uh, there must be something. I always understood that Moshe had carved out the second set. Here we go. Who grabbed the second tablets? Um, ah, here we go. So it says that the Lord said to Moshe, hew for yourself two stone tablets, and I will inscribe upon the tablets. And later on it says, he inscribed the tablets with the words of the covenant. So who was it, God or Moshe? So the commentaries say that when he initially he inscribed refers to Moshe, but when it says I, no, sorry, no, 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 one second. Oh, one suggestion is when it says he inscribed the Metachi Hashem is he, not Moshe. But the other explanation is that basically Moshe engraved them as much as he could and then Hashem basically finished it. Um, you know, it says that the, the letters went yeah. through from one side to the other. Uh, you know, it's famous thing that letters read the same both ways. You know, that it says the letters went through yeah. from one side to the other. The famous question. I never understood how that was possible. Is it some kind of like, you know, you've got a kind of, well, the letters have been an internal kind of uh, like a tunnel through the rock. And the only question that the Midrash has a problem, the Gemara has a problem with is how the final mem, how the middle didn't fall out. It says that was miraculous because obviously think of a stencil, right? You, you can't do a O or a final mem in a stencil. You have to have two little, it's to hold it um but yeah it seems like the suggestion is that it was a joint effort or alternatively when it says oh, he 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 carved but he is god but then that doesn't sit with god telling Moshe to do it himself so interesting good point well well where about. does it say that god tells moses to do the car uh, to inscribe the words themselves it's uh, um, oh, it's in this week's edra pasal lacha carve out for yourself Yes, it says carve out for yourself two tablets, not the words on the tablets. It just means prepare two tablets of stone for me to to write the Torah on. Well, that's that's something I really didn't realise. Oh. That's what how I would understand it. Well, it's misleading us, isn't it? Bob? It may be misleading, but that's how I would understand it. So if it's yeah. it does mean that. Most people mm. haven't looked at it that way. 
Mm-hmm. That's what it seemed to mean when yeah. uh, when it was when you were telling uh, talking about it pre- earlier on, right? At least to me. Yeah. I don't know. I'll actually, give two two tablets, and I will inscribe right. on it. Right. Hmm. Not sure. Honestly, I have to go and do some research on that. But I'm going to have to go. Apologies, got to get to another meeting. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank have you. a lovely week, everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Feel f- Iris, feel Thank free to do some research if you come up with anything. Put it on the WhatsApp group. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very it. unlikely to okay. uh, find anything that you can't, Rabbi. Right. I'm not good enough on the computer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.